inside the admissions office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Ellen, and in each episode, I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of a top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office, will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips to help you get into your dream school. If you'd like to chat with one of these experts, you can sign up for a free consultation at the link in the description of this episode. Today, we'll hear from Catherine Scherer, Ingenious Preps Director of Undergraduate Services. Catherine and I will discuss how 11th grade students can maximize junior year to prepare for college admissions. Hi, Catherine. How are you today? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Alan. Well, could you just start off by telling me a little bit more about yourself, your background, your educational background? I went to Northwestern University for my undergraduate degree. With a little bit of a non-traditional background. My undergraduate degree was in music education and voice performance. So I was preparing to be an opera singer. When I was senior in college, I did my student teaching for my music education degree and just fell in love with and being with students all the time. And I knew I had to do that with my, with my life. So I ended up teaching high school choir for several years before going back and getting a graduate degree in school leadership at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, which is is really sort of what propelled me to come and work at Ingenious Prep. And it has been a, a really wonderful way for me to, you know, continue to do education while also really helping, you know, excellent students get into their dream schools. And do you just want to explain what your role here is at Ingenious Prep? Sure. So I'm the director of undergraduate services, which means that I work with our whole undergraduate population of students from even seventh grade into 12th grade, helping them to, you know, have the best success possible. I do a lot of training of counselors. I do a lot of hiring and helping to make sure that our counselors have all of the expertise that they need in order to do their best work with our students. So to start off with, how can the students start getting more organized in preparation for senior year? So I'm thinking that junior year is like the perfect time to start building these habits. Definitely. Yes. I, I think that junior year is just such a formative time as you're getting ready for the college application prep. A couple of sort of like actionable tips that I have. One is that you can start a journal for personal statement topic ideas. You know, if you have just a journal that's sort of, you know, on your bedside table or something like that, and something interesting happens to your day, write that down. It's, it's a really great way to just sort of start getting material for your personal statement. There are so many students that I sit down with, you know, at the beginning of the personal statement process, and they say, I have no idea what I'm going to write about. Nothing happens to me. Nothing interesting goes on. And of course, that's not the case. It's just that you don't remember them. And so I think that if you're in your junior year and you start just like writing down quick notes, oh, you know, today I realized something really interesting about how much I love history. And this is why I why I realized that, right? You have this sort of bank of things that you can bring up once you get down to that actual personal statement writing process. I think it can be really helpful helpful to just dedicate a specific amount of time each week to thinking about college prep. And that might be an hour. I think that that's probably plenty for most juniors. And I mean this outside of your other extracurricular activities, but like specifically to, you know, college prep, taking an hour to research schools, research different types of majors or programs that you might be interested in. That hour could be the time that you're dedicating to talk with your teachers to help build relationships, to prepare for good letters of recommendation, or an hour to meet with your college counselor. But either way, if you just sort of set aside that time for yourself, I think that can be really, really helpful. The other thing I think is really important for organization is just getting your time management skills really in line. I normally tell students to estimate that working on college applications over the summer and into the fall of 12th grade will be about the equivalent of taking an extra AP class, which is a lot of time. And I think if students are not prepared for that and able to be efficient when they're 11th graders, that's going to be really overwhelming when they're in 12th grade. So all sorts of time management skills, like making sure that you're really effective with your planner or to-do lists or things like that. You know, they're general things that will help you, but you just need to be really organized and on top of things once you get to 12th grade. And what mistakes do you most often see high school juniors making? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that a lot of juniors are really sort of trying to do everything. And that sometimes means that their grades drop. Academics and the grades that you do, the, the grades that you get in school are the most important thing that colleges are looking for. So 
I know a lot of students feel very, a lot of pressure to improve their extracurricular activities, but really focusing on those grades is quite, quite important. And so if students are really trying to do too much in terms of their extracurriculars and their grades drop, that can be a big, a big problem. Another thing I see ha happening is also related to trying to do everything, but it's that students don't try and narrow their focus in terms of their extracurriculars. Most students, by the time they get to 11th grade, do have a general idea of what their academic area of interest is going to be, even if that's just, oh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do humanities, or I'm pretty sure I'm going to do STEM, or I'm pretty sure I'm going to do social sciences. So if you have that basis, the thing that you should really be doing in 11th grade is trying to narrow that down and think about what, what area within STEM, what area within biology, you know, you want to make sure that you're trying to go, at, you know, as, as focused as possible. So the mistake that I see is that students are still just sort of thinking, oh, I'm a STEM student. And STEM is all these are different disciplines, and you need to think about where within that you fall most most close. Related to that as well, another mistake I see is students who sort of join a lot of things in 11th grade instead of trying to deepen their involvement with existing activities. So admissions officers really want to see continued involvement over the course of several years. They do not want to see somebody who just joined everything as a junior. So if you have things that you are currently doing, take advantage of those and really deepen your involvement with them when you're in 11th grade. And how about course loads? So what course loads should they have junior year? And then what course load should they plan for as seniors? Yeah, that's a great question. It's pretty nuanced because it really does vary at every high school. The basic answer is that you want to be maximizing the rigor of your course load in both 11th and 12th grade. That depends on what your high school is looking at. You know, sometimes people ask me, how many AP classes do I need to take? There is no one answer to that because it depends on how many your school offers, how many you're eligible for. If you were able to take AP courses in ninth grade, which is the case at some high schools, the ones you would be taking in 11th grade are going to be different than if your school doesn't allow you to take APs until 11th grade. The important thing you need to know is that you will be evaluated based on your high school context and maximizing the, the opportunities that your school has. So the, the, the bottom line here is that whatever this, the most rigorous course load is at your high school for 11th and 12th grade, that's what you want to be taking. And you can ask that specific question to your college counselor. When you're trying to plan your courses for 11th and 12th grade, say, is this does this count as the most rigorous course load I could be taking? There's actually a box that the college counselor will check on the information they send to colleges that says this is the most rigorous course load possible or close to the most rigorous course load possible. And you want your college counselor to be able to check off that most rigorous course load box. One thing that I think a lot of students think will be okay is, oh, they went through a really tough 11th grade year and now they go to 12th grade and want to take some easier courses. Unfortunately, you can't really let that go, especially in the fall of 12th grade, you still want to be taking strong rigor, even if that means that you're taking some electives, which is often the case for a lot of 12th graders. I see a lot of questions about parents or students who want to know, you know, if, can their student drop their foreign language junior, mm -hmm. senior year? Can they switch to an easier foreign language? Like they got to Spanish three, Spanish three is too hard. Can they switch to like Japanese one? You know, they're like struggling in calcul BC calculus. Should they drop it if it's going to hurt their GPA? Yeah. So I'll take the second part of that question first. A lot of students like are taking that most rigorous course load and it is too hard. If you ask any admissions officer, they're going to say, I want you to be able to take the most rigorous course load and get the best grades possible. But that's not the case for every student, right? There are a lot of places where you're going to have to choose, will I be able to get a better grade in a slightly easier course? And I do think that like that for most students, dropping down the level of rigor a little bit in order to get the best grades possible is normally the right choice. But you do have to realize that there will be other students who are taking the most rigorous courses and getting the best grades. So it's just sort of a, a balance that you need to assess for yourself. If you can maintain an A in the course, then you're at the, the place where that's like the appropriate challenge for you. If it's starting to get lower into the like B range, then that's when you want to think about potentially, you know, dropping down to a different level. 
With regards to foreign language, I think that most of the, the top colleges are looking for at least three years of the same foreign language and really love to see four of the same language. So I do recommend that students continue in that course all the way through their senior year if possible, but definitely at least three within the same, the same foreign language. And of course, extracurriculars also become extra important yep. for juniors. So how can upperclassmen enhance the extracurriculars that they've already become involved in? Yeah, great question. And there are so many different things that I could say here, but I'll try and give some, some good summary uh, summaries here. Basically, what you're trying to do is add impact to whatever organization you're a part of. And so, you know, if you have a blog or some sort of like independent activity, you want to try and get more followers or more people that you're going to impact tutor more students or help those students that you're tutoring get better grades. Another thing you can do is try and help like build out your organization with an executive board that will help you do more things. So I do see a lot of students who are, you know, maybe president of a club and they're trying to do everything themselves, which is not actually the most efficient use of their time. One thing that they could do that would really help like maximize the impact of that organization and help them be more efficient is recruit an executive board, get a marketing, you know, marketing chair, a recruitment chair, and maybe like an operations chair for your club. And then that way you've given some people some leadership positions. You are increasing your leadership by trying to help like structure this organization more effectively. And you're probably going to have better results because you're delegating and giving other people like responsibilities that are better for their skills. So that's something that you can do in a club, in a nonprofit that you might be working in or kind of organization you have. I think building out a leadership team is really, really helpful. For students who are involved in you know, academic clubs and things like that. I think it's wonderful if students can do like a speaker series. Now that so many things can happen over online platforms, it's really a lot easier to do this type of thing. So, you know, maybe you're in a chemistry club, you could invite chemistry grad students from a local university to come and give lectures on specific topics within chemistry to your club. And then that way you've sort of added a layer of insight and, and professionalism to the club you're a part of. Another thing that you can do with academic clubs is do what I call a journal club. This is a little bit more applicable in the sciences, but it's a really common practice for graduate programs to have a journal club in a lab where they'll go through a, an academic article that is very, very current in the sciences, you know, at that point, and everybody discusses it together and tries to learn about what the scientific, you know, conclusions and practices are within that journal. And that can be something that you can add to your club, and it will really help the people in your club understand the workings of the science so much better. And I think it, it can be a really, really great way to add something more to an existing club. I think that Bottom line, the main thing that you want to do in the clubs or organizations that you're a part of is set yourself up for leadership when you're a 12th grader. A lot of schools and a lot of organizations don't allow you to be a leader or have like a leadership title until you're in 12th grade. And so when you're in 11th grade, you need to make sure that you're trying to find those leadership positions and be prepared to be selected for that leadership position by the time you're in 12th grade. And what do you think of students or parents who are like, you know, the student is involved in the piano or they're on the swim team and the family thinks, you know, okay, that's not like a very impressive activity. So we're going to have you quit that activity because it's too time consuming. Mm -hmm. Of course, assuming that it's an activity that the student enjoys and they wouldn't quit yeah. if they had the time. Yeah, I think that that's a really great question, and it really depends on sort of the overall balance of what you're doing. You know, many, many students have sports and music as part of their extracurricular profile, and normally that's a really valuable part of what they do. In general, when you're in 11th grade, I don't want you to be like stopping a lot of things because that will show that you're sort of dropping things and not maybe being able to like maintain the same level of rigor that you were previously. But maybe it means that you drop down to a slightly like lower level, you know, if you are playing the piano, people who do very serious piano are practicing hours every day. If you can use that time more effectively to, to like start a nonprofit or develop more impact 
in an existing organization, then maybe you start practicing piano one hour a day, and then that just opens up a lot of your time without actually dropping it completely. Similarly with sports, if you know, you're know you doing a club sport and, and a school sport, that type of thing, maybe you can drop one of those so that you have more time for your actual academic extracurriculars. But it does really sort of depend on your overall profile. I would say a, a good exercise that you can do is just to start writing down which extracurriculars you might be able to put on your Common App. The Common App allows you to have 10 spots for extracurricular activities. So if you go through it and you've already very clearly got 13, then maybe you can drop a little bit because you won't need to put all of those on your application. But if you're at seven, you definitely don't want to be dropping anything because you're, you, you do want to, to hopefully get to that 10. And how about joining new activities as a junior, as an upperclassman? Is it too okay. late? I don't think it's too late, but I think it's important to choose wisely. I mentioned earlier that doing too much is something that I worry about with 11th graders. So yes, it's okay to add things, but really think about adding things that are going to add to your application and really demonstrate the focus that you're trying to put together. And also don't try and add things that would mean your other activities will suffer. So a couple of things that I think are actually really impactful are like summer activities, planning for the summer after your 11th grade. Those are things that can end up on your activities list. And those are things you definitely should be doing. So adding maybe a research experience or doing a, you know, a summer program at a college. Those are the kinds of things that I think you really, really should be adding as 11th graders. Other than that, it's, it's about making sure that the extracurriculars you might be adding add meaningfully to your profile without taking time away from other things. And it's not uncommon for juniors to just, you know, still not know what they want to major in. Probably it's not even uncommon for seniors to know that. So what do you recommend they do if they're just still like blank slate? I have no idea what I want to do. Yeah, that's a great question. I think in a lot of cases, it, it's helpful to just sort of make a choice. You know, maybe I'm really struggling between these two and I can't decide which one I want to do. An option there is to try and figure out if there's an interdisciplinary interest between those that you might be able to be interested in. I mentioned earlier that one thing you can do to get yourself organized is look at different programs at universities. There's a possibility that if you have two really different interests, there's actually a major somewhere that combines those two interests. Look for those types of things. So I'd say that's one thing, especially if you're struggling between two. If you really have no idea whatsoever, I think it's helpful to make, make a choice and say, you know, I haven't decided yet, but I need to have something that I'm going to put on my applications. So of these five things, I think this one might be the one that I'm interested in right now. At almost every college, you can change majors once you get there, and that is actually something that happens with a large, large, large number of students. But having a, a clear interest on your application is a, is a strategic advantage to actually making a, a really strong application. So in some cases, you might just say, okay, I'm going to go with you know, physics, and I'm going to be okay with that for the next year and a half, and if I really don't like it when I get to college, I'll change. But that will help you like create the best application. Um, another thing you can do is potentially look at liberal arts colleges as an option for your college choice. Liberal arts colleges are generally looking for students who have like broader interests or more varied interests. And so if you're somebody who really doesn't know what they want to do, going to a liberal arts college that values that approach could be a really great option for you. I think that there are some students who have also like changed their mind completely, right? And so they decided that they were, you know, a biology student at first, and now they're like, oh, no, I really just love creative writing. I think that for those students, trying to like frame your current activities to like bridge those two together is really helpful. Maybe looking into those interdisciplinary options that I mentioned previously, or, you know, even trying to find opportunities that would help you bridge those. So like for this student who potentially used to be interested in bi biology and is now interested in writing, there are some like environmental writing competitions. And so that might be a way that the, the student can sort of show the, the connection between those two interests. Just like thinking about junior year, I'm getting stressed out. I'm remembering like how horrible, like what a horrible year that was. There's so many things I have to do. So my condolences to the students. Another thing they have to do is take the SAT or the ACT. So what does that timeline look like 
should they be taking it for the first time as a junior? Should they have already taken it one time as a sophomore? How much time do they need to spend studying for it? Should they take it first semester, second semester? You know, what's like the ideal timeline you give students? That's a great question. There are definitely some students who take it as 10th graders, but I don't think that you need to. I would say that that's only applicable if you're pretty advanced in math and have covered the, the topic, the math topics from the tests in 10th grade already. I think that the best time to take it for the first time is either in the fall or spring of junior year. I do not recommend that students take the test more than three times total. So if you take it in the spring of junior year, you still may be able to take it one more time in the spring and one more time, excuse me, one more time in the summer and one more time in the fall. So you still do have time if you're taking it for the first time in the spring of junior year. I think that fall of junior year gives you a little bit more flexibility and time to be able to do that. So generally speaking, around now would be a great time to be taking the SAT or the ACT for the first time. And I think that, you know, you can always start studying for that two to three months before you're going to take the test. So if that means that you start studying now over winter break to be able to take it in the spring, that's a, that's a really great way to do it. And how do you usually advise that students choose between the tests? Do you ever advise like just take both, see what happens? That's a great question. I say take two practice tests. Take an SAT practice test, take an ACT practice test, see how you feel about them, and then and then go from there. The SAT has a little bit more strategy involved. Like there, the questions are a little bit like trickier in terms of the way that they word them. There's more like test taking skills that you might need for the SAT. The ACT is a little bit more fast paced, but the questions tend to be more straightforward. I found that the ACT felt more like taking a test in school, and that was helpful for me, actually. And so I, I preferred the ACT. The ACT does also have the science section, which is a little bit like intimidating to some students. This I find that that is really about learning how to read graphs and how to be able to interpret data. So if that's something that you feel comfortable with, then I think the ACT is a, a good test for you. But yeah, generally speaking, just take a practice test in each, see how you feel. And then I think it's probably better to just go forward with one so that you're not taking a lot of different tests all the time. I have like a visceral memory of taking the ACT science section and there was like a question about like candles and like you put a jar over it to get rid of the oxygen. It wasn't good. Not for me. But yeah. what about students? Actually, I'm hearing a lot recently and I know you were surprised to hear this, that there's families who are saying like, okay, test optional. So not even going to bother with the test. Like I'll just apply test optional. I'm going to save that time and save that money, like no mm -hmm. stress. And you don't agree with this approach. For most students, I don't. I think that there are definitely like exceptions to that. If you, you know, maybe chronically know that test taking is a really difficult thing for you, then that would be something to consider. But I do still think you should try and take practice tests to see, right? There's no like downside to doing a practice test. If you take a practice test and you say, oh, actually I can do pretty well on this, like take a test, go and do it. I do think that even in the test optional landscape, being able to submit the score is sort of like a bonus. And so you don't want to give up that bonus if you have the opportunity to do it. I generally say you should only choose to be test optional if you don't feel comfortable with the scores you would want to submit, but you want to have that option. And so, you know, I think that you can do a lot of prep at home to save money on it and take the test one time and see how you do. But at least having that score gives you so many more options to be able to demonstrate your candidacy. Junior year is also a time for relationship building. One of those that can be like maybe a little bit awkward is the school counselor, just because it's not somebody that the students interact with daily, like a teacher. So how do you recommend that students get to know their school counselor better and, you know, develop a relationship with them? Yeah, that's a great question and really, really important. I think I definitely didn't know how important it was to have a relationship with my college counselor at all. I don't think that I approached this probably the right way. I think it's helpful to just set up targeted times to talk with your college counselor. There may be like structured, you know, everybody meets with their college counselor one time in the spring of junior year or something like that. And if you have options to go and have additional conversations, that would be great so that they do have the option to get to know you. I think it can be very helpful to have a resume. It doesn't need to be a very professional one, but just like a list of the things that you've done so that you can explain your extracurriculars to your counselor. 
I think that's especially important if a lot of your extracurriculars are sort of like independent things or things that you've done outside of your school community, because then that way they get to know sort of the bigger picture of you and all of the things you're involved with that they may not be aware of from, you know, seeing you in the, you know, soccer team photo or whatever at your school. So go and set up targeted times to talk with them and be able to talk about what matters to you when you have that conversation. It may also be a possibility that you can have a meeting with them, with your school counselor and your parents. And I think that can be a really helpful way to sort of get everybody on the same page, learn about what everyone's expectations are in this process. And then they'll also, you know, know you better by knowing your parents. And some colleges require or prefer that students' letters of recommendation come from teachers that they had junior, senior year. So this is obviously very important to get to know these teachers well. So how can students build those relationships, you know, in like a genuine way so they're not just like, oh, I'm going to get a good letter of recommendation out of you? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, junior year is generally where, where you want to get your letters of recommendations as much as possible. 12th grade is just a little bit like more of a limited scope. And so definitely 11th grade is the time to build the relationships with teachers. I find that performing really well in class and having meaningful participation in class is one of the most important things that you can do. The purpose of the letter of recommendation in your college application file is really to for the colleges to know how you are as a student. What are you going to bring to a classroom environment in college? I think a lot of students think that it's about like all personal qualities and that's part of it, but it's like, how are you a student? Do you participate well? Do you encourage participation from other students? All of those types of things. So, you know, being your best self, Asking meaningful questions in class is really like the primary thing for you to be doing. One thing I like to recommend for students is to go and look at critical thinking question stems, things like how would you compare this to this? And if you have sort of a cheat sheet of more like higher level questions that you could ask in class, put that on your desktop if you're taking notes on your computer, tape it into the front of your notebook if you're taking notes on a, you know, on paper. And then that way you might ask more interesting questions and sort of get more, you know, brownie points in the, in the participation game. I do think it's helpful to go to office hours or stay after class with teachers where you feel like you are building a good relationship with them. That way you do get a little bit of that one-on-one -on -one time. For classes where like you really are interested in the topics, if there's a specific topic that you like really, really loved that the, the teacher brought up, go and do some extra reading outside of class, maybe bring like an article about what's happening in the field right now and talk to your teacher outside of class about it. They are really looking for you to have inquiry and curiosity about intellectual topics. And those types of things will really go a long way in terms of building that relationship and having a positive letter. If there's a possibility to tutor or help other students, offer to do that, right? That demonstrates your willingness to help and can also be a really great way to, again, you know, show genuine interest in a subject area. And moving on to more like specific college prep, how can students start making their college list, especially if they're just like completely like, I have no idea. Like all I know is that there's like Stanford and Harvard and like my local state college, like no idea the difference between any of these, no idea what's good for me. Yeah, that's a great question. I think you need to get started on doing school research. Colleges will publish their like academic criteria. And so generally speaking, you want to see if you are within like the middle 50th percent of the people who are admitted to that college, whether that's GPA or test scores. So that'll give you a sense just sort of right off the bat if you are potentially going to be academically qualified for that school. So that's one way you can get that sense. You can also obviously talk to your college counselor about how well prepared you might be for those different colleges. There are all sorts of online tools that you can use to learn about new schools that you may not have been aware of. Often you can look up like schools like Stanford, right? And you can find out some other schools that may have similar geographic in areas or, you know, similar types of fit. You can always purchase a FISC guide to colleges, which can give you all sorts of information on the many, many, many universities in the United States. And that can give you just sort of like one place to go to that has some really excellent advice and, and tips about those different colleges. Are there any specific tools that are available to students and families that you recommend using in like a specific way? Like, oh, this is how you should be using Naviance if that's available to you. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So if the Naviance scattergrams are probably the most important thing that I work on with students. So Naviance is a tool that a lot of high schools have that sort of tracks their admissions data. And what they'll be able to display for you is like a, a graph of students from your high school who have applied to a specific university and the graph shows their GPA and their test scores. And so you can see on the scattergram if students who had similar grades and test scores to you were or were not accepted at that college. So I think using those scattergrams to get a sense of oh man, nobody with my grades and test scores has gotten into this college from my high school, that's probably not going to happen for you. But if you see that you are sort of like in the green and there are other people who have been accepted with similar scores and grades, then those are some, those are probably, you know, a better fit for you potentially. So I think analyzing each one of those at each college that you are potentially interested in is like the best way to use Naviance. And that's something you can do with your college counselor for sure. Junior year is also a great time to do college tours. I did like a whole um, East Coast, like spring break junior year, like up and down, like to like Brown and Yale and NYU, all that jazz went on the train. What do you think students should focus on in college tours? You know, what do they need to make sure that they're accomplishing and, you know, rather than just like walking around and being enjoying the ambiance? Yeah, I did a similar thing to my junior year. It was actually my dad and I, and it was, I have really, really fond memories because I didn't get as, as much time to spend just with my father, but my mother and my sister went on a trip to Italy and I got to do college tours with my dad. So I don't know who got the better, the better end of that, but it was definitely a special time to, to bond with my dad. When you're on those college tours, one thing that can be helpful is to have sort of a standard list of questions that you're trying to find out at each college. And that can help you just be a little bit more objective about your search and feel more structured in your in your search. It'll help you stay organized in terms of your um, college research as well. I do think it's very, very helpful to go to information sessions and tours. That's sort of like the, the basic definite thing that you need to do. But you would only get the chance to talk to one student normally, that tour guide, when you're on the tour. I think it's really helpful to be able to talk to multiple students to get different types of perspectives. You actually are able to email admissions offices to ask to speak to a current student. That's something that a lot of people don't know you can do. So if you do that ahead of going on that college tour, then maybe you meet the tour guide and a couple of other people. And that's a really great way to get to know multifaceted angles of that college. Um, I think it's helpful to ask about specific programs or even professors that you've looked at, because then that way you can get a chance to learn more about those things that might like align with your academic interests more fully. If you're able to sit in on a class, see if you can do that. For people who are, you know, musicians, you might be able to even take like a mini lesson with a professor and get to know if that might be a good fit for you. So see if you can sort of, you know, experience the college a little bit more than just a tour guide, uh, excuse me, a tour or an info session. And what other ways can students start expressing demonstrated interest in, you know, if they can't make it to campus? Right. So obviously getting to campus is a great way of doing that, but emailing the admissions office, like I said, you can try and meet with those current students. That's great. Virtual tours and info sessions that happen online are also really great ways of getting to, to demonstrate that interest. You can ask to have an on-campus interview with an admissions officer at some colleges. So if you are able to visit, that's a great way to do it. Even if you are virtual, you might be able to speak to an admissions officer. Follow the the college on social media. That's a great way to do it. I think it is important to note that a lot of top schools do not track demonstrated interest at all. So yes, it's important to do this, but it may actually be more important at maybe like target and safety schools than it may be at the like top, top, top reach schools for some students. It does tend to be more important to demonstrate interest at smaller colleges and liberal arts colleges because they want to know that, that students are interested in that particular college. And I've heard the recommendation before that students can use the same email for all of their college communications and applications, just in case the school does track demonstrated interest and also just so everything can be nice and organized. So do you recommend that? 
I definitely do. I think it's really helpful to have a professional email address. Do not use the one you made in middle school that has like, you know, whatever your favorite, you know, I don't know, emoji or something was in the, in the name of the email. You want to have a professional email address that includes your first and last name. I think it's really helpful to have that, like you said, to, to stay organized, but it, it is actually also helpful to have an independent email address, not associated with your high school, because you may want to have that email address after you graduate to continue conversations with colleges. So that's, I think, an added bonus there. But please, please, please make sure that you check that daily. It's really important to make sure you're, you're responsive to things that colleges are emailing you. And you actually recommend that students start on any of the application components as a junior. Are there things that you see students doing where you're like, no, 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 you didn't need to start that that early. This might even be like counterintuitive versus things where you're like, no, like this definitely is beneficial. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that for most things, the earlier, the better. Like, see students who start essays really early, that can be helpful. Things are going to change a lot, though. So I think that, like, there are some students who think, oh, man, I'd love to just have everything finished by, like, June before my, my, my senior year. And I think that's a little bit too ambitious because you're going to mature after June of your, of your senior summer. And so I don't think that having things, like, finalized is ever a good idea. But having drafts of things is always helpful. If you have, you know, even different drafts of essays that you're thinking about, that'll help you when you are needing to like make decisions about which one you're actually going to use. Some things that I think are actually very helpful though, are trying to write what I call a Y major essay. Many, many colleges have a supplemental essay that's essentially saying, why are you interested in studying X major at our college? And I find it really helpful for 11th graders to try and write that, to try and figure out what their genuine interest really is. Students who write that essay sometimes find out, oh, maybe I don't have as strong of a rationale for in that my interest as I thought I did. And then in the, the rest of their 11th grade, they can actually try and come up with experiences to help them demonstrate that rationale more effectively. So I actually think that's a, a really, really effective thing to do in your 11th grade. When you're doing all of those college tours or researching colleges, please, please, please start writing all of that information down. Take all of that research in an organized spreadsheet so that you can come back to it when you need to write what are called why school essays. The, the essential essay prompt is, why are you interested in coming to X school? So what you don't want to have happen is you've gone on a tour, you've talked with an admissions officer, you've talked with a student, and then you forget all of that information when you actually need to write a Y school essay. So keep track of all of that information in an organized way. That's very, very, very helpful. I also think it is helpful to start writing down what you think those activities are going to be on your list. I mentioned earlier, you're going to have 10 spots for activities. You'll also have five spots for what are called honors and awards. And so if you start writing down now, okay, here are like maybe the eight extracurricular activities I have, maybe that gives you an, ex an excuse to figure out what nine and 10 are going to be. Maybe you don't have more than three honors and awards. Now is a good time for you to start building those things up. Another thing I mentioned previously is like writing a journal for potential personal statement topics. And one thing that can be helpful is just to practice reflective writing in general. This is something that a lot of high schools aren't really teaching anymore. And so many students come to the personal statement and they've never really written about their own experiences, their own opinions, or how they feel. And so in 11th grade, if you can just maybe write, you know, an essay about why is my family important to me and just practice like reflective writing prompts like that, you'll sort of like exercise those muscles in a way that you probably haven't been challenged to do in high school and will really prepare you for the type of writing you'll need to do for college applications. And coming to the, uh, towards the end of junior year now, when we're thinking about the summer after junior year, before senior year, what do students need to be doing during the summer versus what mistakes should they skip? Yeah. So I think the things that you definitely need to be doing are just like planning an active summer. Make sure it's full of things that are related to your application and the, the area of interest that you have. So you want to make sure you have some time to work on your college applications. Don't build so, 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 so much in your summer that you won't actually be able to get a head start on that before school starts. But 
look at each week of your summer and try and figure out, you know, maybe I'll do a summer program for this part. Maybe I'll be working on my nonprofit tutoring during this part of the summer. You can have fun too. If you need to have a vacation, like do, do spend that time. It's going to be a stressful fall at the beginning of 12th grade. So plan that time in too, but just try and make sure that you're being intentional about what you plan for your summer. I do think that it's helpful to have backup plans. You know, a lot of students maybe are looking for an internship or something that might be a little bit of like a high level or a competitive competitive opportunity after their 11th grade, and it might not work out. So plan a backup plan in addition. I think that the, the major like mistake that I see students doing after their 11th grade is planning something that's really unrelated to their interests or like not having anything planned. We do get a lot of questions about like, what about summer jobs? You know, is it okay for me to go and like, you know, work at Dairy Queen over the summer? And I think that that's really, really okay. And it's something that actually a lot of students don't do. What I would recommend that you do if that's what you need to do for your summer is take that journal for potential personal statement topics. I've seen that summer jobs can be a really, really, really great place for learning and for reflection about what might end up in a personal statement and see if there's any way to sort of frame that experience that's related to your interest. You know, maybe you are interested in business and so actually working in an organization at like the lowest level and, you know, scooping that ice cream is something that can help you understand like what a business looks like and how a business is operated. My last question will just be how can underclassmen set themselves up for success early? So if somebody's listening right now, they're in eighth, ninth, 10th grade, what can they do so that by the time that this episode is actually completely relevant to them that they're already like in the perfect position? Yeah. I mean, so, so many things, but I'll sort of talk about like the high level, most important things. I'd say that like narrowing down your interests a little bit earlier is really, really helpful for eighth and ninth graders. The earlier, you know, sort of what you think you might want to do, the more you can start planning your extracurriculars to align with that interest. And so, you know, if you know already that you're potentially interested in biology as a ninth grader, you can be doing biology activities and trying to like maybe find research opportunities or summer programs in biology biology earlier, earlier on. If it takes you all the way until 11th grade to decide that, it's just harder to show as much depth or sustained involvement in your extracurriculars as I, many admissions officers are hoping to see. The other thing I think you can do is not just decide what that major might be, but also think about like the, the nuances of that academic field and like which part of biology you might be interested in. You know, maybe you're looking into computational biology. Maybe it's really that you love like human or plant biology. You know, if you can figure out the sort of more, more specific area within that academic field, again, you can sort of demonstrate that niche interest more effectively throughout the rest of high school. I would say the other really important thing is just to make sure you're doing rigorous courses in high school. That's something that you can't really go back and change, obviously, and you know you can't go back and change your grades. So young younger students really need to be focusing on that rigor and making sure that they're doing a great job in their classes. And do you have any other words of wisdom that you want to share with students? You know, Ellen, you said that 11th grade is really challenging and it is. So I would say, you know, hang in there and really try and think, think about how you want to be the best version of you. Obviously there's all sorts of like strategic advice I can give, but the best thing that colleges want to see is a genuine person who has loved doing the things that they've done in high school. So if you try and maximize the thing that you love, right? And that's, I know it's a, it's a little bit, you know, touchy feely advice, but I think it's really important and something that is, is important in the college admissions process. Be genuine to who you are and the things you really want to do. Thank you so much for joining us today, Catherine. I'm sure our listeners appreciate your insight into how 11th graders can prepare early for college admissions. For more information, check out our blog linked in the episode description. If you have any questions or would like to request a topic for a future episode, go ahead and give us a follow and send us a message on social media with the hashtag Inside Admissions. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office.